thank you uh, at the outset thanks for this invite very interesting offbeat topic uh, something that is my favorite topic as well so yeah so i have don't no disclosures with respect to this this is my team i am from spash hospital bangalore so first of all just a brief introduction what is marathon what is triathlon so basic question so many of them might marathon actually means 42.2 kilometers run that's marathon so there is no 5k marathons 10k marathons like people call but marathon means 42.2 km half marathon means 21.1 ultra marathons are distances more than 42.2 km any distance run more than 42.2 is called ultra runs ultra marathons are ultra ultra runs and there are other runs like 5k 10k etc what's a triathlon triathlon is actually three sports put into one it's a swim cycle run back to back uh olympic distance triathlon means 1.5 km swim and a 40 km cycling and a 10 km run to be done one after the other and there's something called as 70.3 ironman distance or it's also called half iron distance so it's a 1.9 km swim and then a 90 km cycling and a 21 km run completed in quick succession where it has to be done within 8 and 1/2 hours and the the big bull is the iron man so this is the toughest one a 3.8k swim and a 180 km cycling and followed by which you have to do a 42 km run and if you have to finish all this over 16 to 17 hours you, you start at 7 am you finish by mid, by before midnight 12 so a uh, big one that is so how fit are you so this is a question that we should ask ourselves so our surgeons fit you know there is so do we have it in us to take up running marathon doing triathlons can we give that much amount of time for training and how long will it take for us to compl- or to be ready to be able to do this so there is i was looking up on surgeons physical health i found this one article uh, you know which had come up in uh, research the general surgical residents aerobic fitness is way lesser compared to a non surgical resident because we work long hours our efforts are more we don't really take care of our health that much is what was the article which was pretty surprising but off late things are much better during our ug days this was pretty much true we had all big huge surgeons big tummy big tummy more experience more famous you know this is what used to be in during our ug days now things are way better now it's not that bad so how much time do we need couch absolutely nothing to a marathon about 12 to 20 months of systematic training so this is a recommended somebody may be able to do it faster than that but it's always better that you build your base or foundation and then be ready to run a 42 km run so about 8 to 10 hours of training per week which will have 3 to 4 runs one being a long there will be two or three short runs half you know one hour to one and a half hour or two hours two hours is short run and then then there will be long runs 3 to 4 hours 2 hours 3 hours 4 hours like that and there should at least be 2 hours of 2 2 or 3 sessions of strength training per week because when you are putting your body through that much amount of uh, endurance training you should have good strength as well so uh, one day for upper body maybe one day for legs and one day for core training so this is at least 3 sessions of strength training is required if you want to do a marathon for a triathlon now triathlon is the next big thing so i'll talk 70.3 distance so if you are somebody who's not done anything if you are already a marathon runner you can think about getting into a 70.3 if you are not then you need to think about olympic distance to begin with or start with runs and then gradually get into it because you need to be proficient in swimming in open water maybe sea then you have to be able to cycle and then you have to be able to run after that so it takes a lot so if you want if you're already a marathon runner then 70.3 is something that you can think about 12 to 16 hours of training per week so that will be like 3 to 5 hours of swimming per week 5 to 7 hours of cycling per week and 4 to 5 hours of run per week so this is along with that at least two sessions of strength training of 30 to 30 minutes each so this much is the requirement that you need to put in about 8 to 10 months of efforts if you don't know swimming you need about 10 months after being a marathon runner or a cyclist to be able to do an ironman and if you know swimming 
then maybe six to eight months is good enough a time. But then again, swimming, open water, sea is something totally different than doing it in the pool. So that's something to be kept in mind. So couch to triathlon, two to three years, approx for a 70.3. So what do you all need? So there are there is a big set of requirements if you want to do one. This is the recommended one. You can do on your own probably, but then you need a coach. It's always good to train with training buddies or group. You need a good shoes, attire, nutrition planning, physio. You know, so this running is relatively cheaper, low cost. You know, it doesn't require much, but the triathlon is a very expensive sport. You need coach, training buddies. Anyway, that's a basic requirement. You need a bike, which can cost a good one anywhere between 80, 90 thousand to 10 lakh, 15 lakhs. So it's huge expense. Then you need a shoe, cycling shoe, running shoe. You need a helmet. You need a glove. You need a bike trainer, a tri suit, a running, you know, nutritional planning. You need a physio. You know, you, you, you need to have a good physio. You, you will have some strains, pains, aches. You need physiotherapist to help you through all that. So yeah, this is my triathlon kit. This is when I did Goa Ironman in 2019. So uh, you need this is the whole requirement that you need to get ready the previous night before you go to that. So is it all possible? Uh, yes, definitely. This was me 2015. 2017, Berlin Marathon. So one, about 18 months. 2019, Ironman Goa. And the journey has continued. 2021, I did Barcelona Ironman. And 2022, I did U Utah USA, 70.3 Ironman. Um, Goa Swimathons, 5K. And, and that was the best. Probably I even got qualified. I, in my age category, 40 to 44, I stood fifth. So I got a chance to go to World Championship, at, which I did it in Utah last year. So, yeah. <laughs> so, is it possible? So, for anybody. So, just, just to give some... Thought process, the oldest Ironman finisher is a 87-year-old, 2018. Oldest female Ironman finisher. That's the full iron distance I'm talking, not the 70.3. The full iron distance, 3.8 plus 180 plus 42. The oldest woman to have completed is 78 years. But it's a lot about mind over body. You need a lot of uh, people behind you. You need a good team at work. To support you in all these, you need family support. You are missing in the morning. Every morning at 5, you are out and come back at 8, get ready, off to work at 9, then come back late. So you, the family has to adjust as well. When people like them can do triathlons and running, that lady has doesn't have both hands, both legs. She's a runner from Bangalore. And this guy has completed the full iron distance in Kona 2011. So when such people can do why can't we? I believe if I can do, anybody can do. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. And thank you to the organizing committee and the chairpersons. Well, actually, I'm a dermatologist, but a very passionate strength training athlete and I'm preparing for my Ironman next year. So, um, expectations from our bodies. Have joints, will bend. But reality, we're bending at the wrong places. We all as uh, physicians are very concerned about stress management, work-life balance, our mental health, physical activity, diet control, but what about our occupational health? Occupational musculoskeletal injuries are common to the tune of 60 to 80 percent in practicing surgeons. All of this is mainly because of primarily poor posture, lack of frequent stretching and mobility, lack of a strength training routine, lack of good OR ergonomic setups. Add to it the aggravating factors of using headlights, loops, microscopes, and laparoscopic instruments. The areas commonly known to be affected are the neck, back, and shoulders, followed by legs, arms, and even hands, especially in laparoscopic surgeries. The symptoms may vary from severe musculoskeletal pain of varying degrees, joint stiffness and lack of mobility, 
not able to move the joints through the full range of motion, lack of flexibility, numbness, fatigue, and all of this will ultimately lead to a very poor quality of life for the surgeons. The most common postural deficits encountered are a head forward neck flex position, internally rotated shoulders, kyphotic thoracic, uh, kyphotic, uh, thoracic spine, lumbar lordosis, anterior pelvic tilt. Currently, the surgeons are incorporating some methods to reduce it as much as possible, like using armrests or standing pads, adjusting the table height, adjusting the patient or monitor positions, and even taking timed micro breaks. But these are not the long-term solutions. What we really need is primarily postural re-education and practicing it day in, day out. The neck needs to be vertical, the shoulders and the pelvis need to be level. The thumb, toes, and feet should be facing forward. This is the standard normal posture. The other things needed besides a good ergonomic setup are a self-motivated and a mindful surgeon, following a dedicated strength training, stretching, and a mobility routine, attending to their specific recommendations for correcting their own imbalances, and considering alternative therapies for any existing discomfort. For musculoskeletal issues, a multidisciplinary approach is needed where phys phys physical therapists, occupational therapists, personal trainers are closely involved with the surgeons. Group exercise sessions can be organized within the hospital. Uh, easy access to gym on premises on the hospital should be made available, as well as the doctors, surgeons should be encouraged to participate in various sports events like marathons, triathlons, cyclothons, etc. From my end, I have uh, tried to prepare a short video of basic movements in a flow fashion that can be practiced and if done routinely for just 15 minutes every day can help solve a lot of issues. So this is the most common deformity, head forward, neck flexed. For this, we should be doing wall chin tucks. Two to three sets of each of the exercises demonstrated are good enough. Simple neck rotations, flexion, extension. All of these can be easily done either within the OR or outside of it at your own comfort. Doesn't need any equipment. All it needs is a little bit of time and dedication. These are for the internally rotated shoulders. Simple I, Y, T and W movements. Initially, there may be an issue taking it to full range, but with regular and routine practice, one will be able to. Wall slides, initiating with a 30 second hold followed by dynamic slides. Doorway pectoralis stretch can be done anywhere. The elbows need to be maintained at 90 degrees. Very commonly, we encounter kyphotic thoracic spines in all of us. These are very simple to do movements. Again, if done repeatedly and routinely, will help open up the thoracic spine. They can be done supine or even in a standing bent over position. Some stretches to open up the lumbar spine. 15 to 20 second holds at least is recommended. Even if we do just two sets of all of these, won't take more than 10 to 15 minutes. 
this is a foam roller that i have incorporated it can also be used to do the myofascial release for tight muscles Some of these are very good spine openers. Can be done before surgeries, in the micro breaks or even after surgeries or just at the comfort of your homes at any time. Core strengthening is a very very important aspect we all should look into. That includes strengthening our glutes. All of us suffer from some degree of anterior pelvic tilt. All that leads to a lower cross syndrome and needs to be practiced frequently how to correct it. Resistance bands can be used for simple activations. Rotator cuff strengthening is a very important thing that one needs to practice every day. Thank you. So let's stay active and let's keep our expectations high. Thank you, uh, sir. And after these uh, two talks, I, I, I think I should just rest my case and leave the podium from here because that's probably the best thing that they've advised you to go forward. Uh, one's an Iron Man, uh, one's training to be an Iron Man, and I'm just about started there. So weight loss for surgeons, when uh, Ramana asked me to do this talk, I asked him exactly, bro, what do you want me to speak on? And that's exactly the story of every surgeon's life. How many of you, by a show of hands, have faced this situation in your life? Very few non-hardworking surgeons, looks like. Oh, at least all the four panelists <laughs> believe so. Well, um, this is it. Actually, uh, I want you to concentrate on that last slide with that uh, surgeon there with the mask in the blue. It is an Italian brain surgeon, had a heart attack in the middle of an operation. He powered through it when he realized that the patient would never ever have recovered had he stopped. And that's how a surgeon is. That's how we are mentally trained to be. So we'll, we'll compensate on every ounce of our body just to make sure that we deliver the best things that we can. Uh, this, is, this is exactly, a few of us have been seen, quite often I'm seen, before doing an emergency surgery, lying on the cold uh, marble floor, and that's probably the best place to be. And sometimes when people see me uh, with my eyes, uh, just prior to surgery, they even wonder, how is this guy ever gonna operate? But you put the lights on, you put a scalp in your hand, and most surgeons transform into some kind of a different being, and they're spot on. And that's when they compensate, and they give up a lot of their body just to fit in there. So there was a study and the adverse effects of health and well-being of working as a doctor, views of the UK medical graduates between this year. And what they said is that stress and life balance and workload was probably both males and females included. Uh, illness uh, was the next. Exercise, weight and alcohol. Now abuse in terms of alcohol, in terms of wherever would be added on and the easiest thing to compromise is your exercise or your diet patterns and that's why your weight goes on. Uh, availability of support, very little when it comes to being a doctor and you ask for help. Uh, a cricketer or a sports star or an actor 
can probably work a, a bit longer and every everyone from the media to everyone says so hard working you try and tell the uh, the family skin that you've gone for a movie with your family and you've not received their call and then see what the re reaction will be you're not supposed to be you're supposed to be working all the time so that's the truth about doctors and surgeons uh, now doctors were asked why they were unable to work out well easiest excuse i'm so busy work keeps me occupied uh next game family commitments so probably they definitely want to talk about murli or priyanka here because they've seemed to find time for the iron man and training for it and these two ones excuses fatigue i can understand that was one thing injury or illness we just heard priyanka say the amount of injuries we do to our body when we operate hours and hours together uh, lack of facility no interest at least people are being honest and saying no interest and that's why i have not really worked out in 1% of surgeons now causes of weight gain the last slide i put up was something that was given out during the Ossicon uh, 2019. If that's the kind of food that surgeons are going to be fed, it's a strange thing that we are all still managing to stay fit. All right, so this is at the obesity surgery meeting, and that's the kind of uh, food that was given out. All right, now excessive consumption of tea and coffee, all of us do take tons and tons of tea and coffee. We forget sometimes the amount of sugar we add in our teas and coffees, and that's where we put on our weight. Uh, poor eating habits, skipping meals, that's a very common thing with most surgeons. Uh, poor access to healthy food options. And, and even in my hospital, I crave to eat something healthy. And uh, Nidhi will bear me out that there's very little healthy snacking options that are available out over there. And stress, which adds to wrong eating habits, of course. Really. So stress and burnout among surgeons. Well, we all do understand that Stress and burnout is a given thing. It affects not only our professional demeanor and our behavior, but also our personal lives. And therefore, the practical list in terms of whatever we do, that kind of adds on to our miseries. Now, stress among surgeons. If you look at all the various specialities, there's no hernia specialist here, but I would put them in the general category. So if you look at 47% were stressed out, ENT was probably the best, only 11% were stressed out. So they didn't really have orthopedic surgeons, 24. I think they brought out all their stress onto those bones. Uh, the thoracic surgeons, well, 37%, urology, and the list goes on and on. Uh, coming down to the vascular surgeons being only 4%. I don't know how they don't get stressed. Probably the blood just keeps them active. Now, in terms of the cortisol levels, we all do know that sometimes cortisol is linked to obesity, the high and low cortisol reactivity and food intake in people with obesity and heavy weight. Stress levels may lead to changes in the circulating concentrations of cortisol, insulin, ghrelin, and leptin. And we all do know that as obesity surgeons, we've all heard of these four hormones. Now you ask anybody from endocrinologists or anybody, they'd say your leptin is directly linked to the amount of fat mass that you have or inversely proportional to that. Uh, the foods eaten during times of stress typically favor those high fat or sugar content because there's a hedonistic center in your brain which says, oh, I am satisfied. And that's why we go and heat out at those things and those foods easiest. Now, obesity is multifactorial. And if we add all these various things, we do understand that not only genetic, but also your environment. So what we do add, your socioeconomic environment, globalization, market integration, occupation, healthcare, consumer behavior, food availability, screen time, everything else, culture, community, societal norms, societal support, body size preferences, all this adds on to, to say why obesity is a disease that very few have found options for and it continues to grow as a chronic life-threatening disease. Well, the ob obesity pandemic, as the obesogenic environment keeps going on, keeps going from time to time, and the result is a global obesity pandemic that kills more people even today. Even during the times of COVID, we do know that more people who are obese actually died. More obese doctors uh, lost their lives or were admitted to ICUs than not. All. Complications of obesity, well, we all do know these things. What all can it be caused? Uh, well, low risk, moderate risk of heart attacks, diabetes, and various other things in terms of distribution. I just wanted to cover this. Would you trust a fat doctor? Well, a study published in the International Journal of Obesity said no. So if you want to 
remain fat, well, there are a few patients who might actually go out and trust you. So just imagine your image does, does really matter. And this was done by John Hopkins. Fat doctors make fat patients feel better or for worse. Patients are more apt to trusting overweight doctors when it comes to diet advice, a study finds. But they are more also likely to feel that the overweight doctor is judging them about their weight. And these are facts and proven things. So remember that it's very difficult for an obese person to actually recommend a person to lose weight. And every other disease is caused with, with weight loss. Well, my time's up, so I won't really cover everything. All I want to say is that We've got lots and lots of options to treat obesity. It's a lifelong disease. I think the best options are what they've recommended. If not, I'm there. Thank you. So I think in life there are some talks that you give because you're excellent at that. And maybe there's some talks that you give because you are not very excellent at that. And I think it is hilarious that as I'm talking about how to balance things, I'm frantically running between sessions. So um, these are my disclosures. And I, I probably do need this talk more than anyone in this room. Um, you can ask my partner, Dr. Paul. I tend to operate a lot, and I tend to operate really late. So I am going to present a lot of things from um, two main sources. And so when I think when you when you graduate residency or fellowship, people don't really ask you what your dream job is. And I think that this is so key. When we become surgeons, you know, we love our jobs, but sometimes maybe you don't dream of labor and spending all of your time in the hospital. And maybe we need to think about things outside the hospital. And so I love this quote. <laughs> if you are struggling to find work-life balance, no amount of yoga is going to fix it. And so a lot of the content from my talk are from these two authors. If you have an opportunity to read any of their books. They are absolutely fantastic. Adam Grant is in charge of um, institution economics, which is very cool. And uh, Simon Sinek does a lot of work with uh, leadership. And so why is work-life balance in medicine so hard? And I think there are a lot of reasons. Number one, urgent or emergent patient issues. There's someone that needs to go back. There's a phone call that needs to be returned. The increasing ER demands, which can take a long time to document and make sure everything is billed appropriately. Certainly, there is a culture of burnout um, where it's work as hard as you can. If that's not as a resident, we had to limit work hours to only 80. Um, and there's increasing expectations from your administrators to work more, to make more money, from your partners, um, as well as your patients. They want you to be available all of the time. And so how do you balance that? I think this is important. Remember, you should prioritize this because this matters. 46 of general, 46 percent of general surgeons feel that they are burnt out. And why does being burnt out matter to you, to your patients? Because bad things happen. You're more likely to get to, get a divorce, abuse substance, physician suicide is a real thing. When you care for your patients, you increase medical errors, you have reduced patient satisfaction, and they're going to want to call you more. Um, you can have issues with professional misconduct. And in reality, to the healthcare system, they need to invest in this because it's going to make you a more effective physician. So how to prioritize you? And I think there's a couple of things I'm going to talk about. Number one, if you want to, it's okay to work at home. The work needs to get done. It doesn't matter where it is. If you're someone that likes to operate in the hospital and then go home and do notes, okay. But it's also okay to leave work to go home. No one is going to ensure that your life is balanced. That is your job. And the consequences of imbalance are yours to deal with. So how to achieve balance? First thing is, I think, optimize your team. Help others help you. If you can have meetings with the people that help care for your patients, that ensures effective meeting flow. And I invest in your community. And I think my goal is, is when I'm out of town at conferences, I want my nurse practitioner to be comfortable taking all the patient phone calls because I have educated her. This allows you to leave and feel like your patients are getting taken care of, and it allows them to feel comfortable caring for your patients. It allows things to run very effectively. I think it's very important as us to set boundaries. It's okay to be away. In my training with all the people I worked with, when they were on vacation, they would not respond to a text message. That was the culture that they had created. So you got to go on vacation. If your patients were dying in the hospital, you would hear about it when you got back. Um, it's important to invest in opportunities aligned with your goals. So if you are you know, invited to go talk at a conference and it's going to be a really big stressor, you don't, and no advantage to you professionally, you can say no to that. That is an OK thing to do. Um, 
It's impossible to please everyone. The question is whether you're disappointing the right people. Part of setting healthy boundaries is deciding who you're willing to let down and who has the right to make you feel guilty. Not everyone deserves power over your emotions. I think the other thing is focus on your priorities. If that's academic advancement, patient care, and education, invest in those. Do things that make you happy. But there's no problem with your, if your priorities are your family, your hobbies, and maybe also patient care. Do what makes you happy. And I think this is important. You develop yourself outside of work. So try to create, curate a life you enjoy. Set goals for your personal life. I think it's very important to exercise, and certainly there's a lot of data about you know, how to mitigate burnout, about exercise, and try new things. So I was really struggling. I was a big runner, and I said, listen, I am working so hard, I'm no longer running, and I'm not very happy about it. So I got a personal run coach. She kicked my butt. <laughs> I've been running five, six days a week for a year, and I actually just did the New York Half Marathon. Did pretty OK. But uh, it was very humbling because I didn't meet my goal. So I got to run some more. So I think it's very important to, to have a life that you enjoy outside of your job. The last thing I think is important is to achieve, invest in the future. Seek out opportunities to be a mentor. When you see other people succeed, that naturally makes you happy. It makes your job fulfilling. Build your community around you so that they can enjoy the things that you have. And educate the next generation. Because certainly when you are done and get to take a step back, seeing other people succeed is one of the most rewarding things. So obviously we know that the culture in surgery is not the one that really prioritizes work-life work balance. So I think what we need to do is be uh, champions of change. Invest in your colleagues' happiness. If they need to leave to go to a conference, you know, or a daughter's play or something, be there to support them knowing that they are going to support you. Celebrate things other than just a great case, no complications, doing a case quickly. Set an example of work-life balance, not only for your colleagues, but your trainees, so that they know that they can achieve this too. Respect the boundaries of your partners or the other people you work with, and prioritize longevity. Because in reality, if you work really hard for a couple of years, you probably won't work very hard for 10. And this is not about the next year or the year after that. It's how do you, you know, preserve yourself over time to be a great physician for the years to come. So work-life balance sets the bar too low. No one grows up dreaming of a job that doesn't interfere with their life. We hope to spend our waking hours doing work that enriches our life. A toxic job drains you, a decent job sustains you, and a healthy job invigorates you. So I hope we can all have healthy jobs. Thank you very much. So it's a great honor and privilege to be presenting this talk in front of all of my friends and colleagues and my chairpersons. So my first disclosure is I am not a guru. And whatever I am going to speak is not an advice. I'm just sharing from my experiences, my learnings, and a few thoughts. So mental health, we all know that the positives are happiness, enthusiasm, growth, fulfillment, influence on environment, and the list is huge. But the negatives also, the list is huge, like anxiety, stress, regret, depression, loss of motivation, frustration, anger, helplessness, bitterness. And even this list is endless. And if we talk about defining mental health, again, there's a plethora of definitions, and we wouldn't know if we are going in the right direction. But one of the things that I found useful as a definition was that mental health is not a destination, but as a process. But it is not about how you drive, not where you're. It is actually about how you drive and not about where you're going. But still, we like to put mental health into boxes like stress, anxiety, depression, frustration, burnout. And it's a Pandora's box. If we talk about burnout, it's a syndrome characterized by emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, a decreased sense of personal accomplishment, and it's caused by work-related stress. And the risk factors are uh, women are more prone to it, type of practice, if it is private it versus non-private. Speciality trauma is more prone to it, and there are many other risk factors. And this has been studied extensively, and in fact, there's a systematic review on this. The consequences are medical errors, depression for surgeons, suicidal ideation, and all this has been documented in data. Addictions, deterioration in interpersonal relationships, 
loss of drive and motivation. So what can help us have a good mental health? Awareness, for one, a mindset, beliefs, emotional intelligence is very much on the cards, certain practices and we'll look at them, family support, friends and community, and essentially a decision to take responsibility and work on our own mental health. And just a few tools for a good mental health, which we can see is awareness, where there are three types, but here we are going to talk about self-awareness, which is the ability to focus on yourself and how your actions, thoughts and emotions do or don't align with your internal standards. Okay, so the role of self-awareness is for introspection, for self-discovery, self-monitoring, self-directed growth. And what matters most is how you see yourself. Talking about beliefs, well, whenever an event happens in our life, our mind is a machine which actually creates a meaning. We all give meaning to every event that happens to us. And when we start giving these meanings over and over and over again, then they transform into what is called as a belief. And once this is a belief, then the belief starts giving to us what is this event. For example, if on the road there's an accident scene, an old man is lying down and a rickshaw or a car is standing by and people are gathered, the first thing that will come to our mind is, well, this rickshaw wala or the car must have knocked him down. But that may not be true. That comes out of our belief that all rickshaw walas or all drivers are careless. But that driver could very well be stopping there just to help that man. So our beliefs start giving our events. And beliefs affect our individual's perceptions of reality by creating filters that are applied at the beginning of the decision-making process to evaluate the facts. So basically, the story is well known by Plato when he was sitting at the door of the city and a person came to ask him, Sir, how is this city? I am new to him. So Plato asked him, how was the last one? He said, well, that was a wonderful city. The people were very nice, very good, friendly. Plato told him, well, this one is going to be the same. And when another person came by and asked the same question to Plato, the per and Plato asked him, how was the first one? The, the person said, well, it was a hell of a city. People were absolutely thugs and uh, they like, I have looted me. Plato said to him that, well, this city is not going to be any different. So our beliefs are going to determine how we experience life. And if we look at our beliefs, the beliefs could be about ourself, whether I'm worthy, I'm competent, or I'm good enough. Or it could be that I'm worthless, I'm incompetent, I'm not good enough. The beliefs can be, these are global beliefs about the world around us, like the world or the people are harsh and they're against me. Or they could be powerful beliefs like the world is friendly and it's with me, it's helping me, it's conquerable. So we experience life through the goggle of our beliefs and our beliefs give us meaning of what happens to us around. So I would really like to make, and I do make it a practice to examine my beliefs and change them to better ones if needed. And this can happen through commitment, using awareness, working actively on our inner self, because it's the inner game that determines the quality of our outer game. So let's look at our emotions. We, the commonly experienced emotions are anger, fear, disappointment, frustration, guilt, anxiety, depression. So Tony Robbins was the one who suggested that why can't they be used as tools? Normally negative emotions put us down and take us on a downhill course. But can they be used as tools to find out why they are occurring and then use them as a feedback to become a better person? For example, anger. What is the underlying pointer or what is the underlying message? When I get angry, probably one of my important rules has been broken by someone or by my own self. That's why I'm, I, I'm angry at that person. Or it could be a trigger from my past hurt or a past anger in my childhood. Feedback clues, well, you have to then stop and ask yourself, if my rule has been broken, did the other person really know that this is my rule? Have I communicated my rules to the other person? What is the trigger in my past that is causing me to get angry? I am getting angry today from an incident of in my childhood which I don't even remember. And what is my belief that is going to be being challenged? That's why I am getting angry. So the next time uh, my, your core beliefs are challenged, try being curious instead of furious. A very nice quote by Randy Gage. Again, fear is a pointer that you are not prepared enough, hence you are afraid. 
fear of failure because if i fail means that i am incapable incompetent i am incapable maybe i am helpless i am not worth it so these kind of meanings give that fear of failure a different meaning a past incident in my life can make me feel incapable weak and afraid basically fear is a protective mechanism of my subconscious mind and trying to save me from danger so how can we use it as a tool acknowledge that i am feeling afraid take the lesson that fear is trying to teach you embrace it and take the action and let the fear go and use courage consciously because courage is not absence of fear courage is acting even though you are afraid to act stress is again the same stress is not just emotional cognitive it has got physical consequences we all know about the stress response and it has surgical consequences also and this is a well studied subject even hurt disappointed uh, disappointment can be a pointer that an expectation that i had from myself or from somebody else has been betrayed so the tool or remedy could be let me identify what expectation that i had which is now broken is my expectation was my expectation justified was it communicated to the other person that this is what i expect of you if i have let down myself can you, can you i would accept us, please, that wow Shindi? and not to do it again can you just wrap up for us thank you yeah so when your body is filled with stress and anxiety it's a message that is trying to tell you that you need to make some changes so there are many practices that are going to help us like mindfulness being in the present forgiveness self esteem gratitude meditation journaling a belief like this too shall pass and being in the present because we all try to live in the past and the future and hardly live in the present so mental health at workplace is all everything always begins with self we must respect people around us trust is a powerful currency for creating a culture of excellence integrity is non negotiable intention to be happy peaceful is a propeller for creating conditions for good health and the journey of 1000 miles begins with a single step thank you thank you pramod for giving me this opportunity to share my experiences through which i have gone through in last uh say about 8 years 8 uh, years back the story started and uh, i have learned a lot from my own experiences and definitely i'll share whatever i have gone through i was doing well till 2015 when i was operating lot of cases attending conferences being honored by chief minister and others in 2015 i got a mediastinal lymphadenopathy and i was advised by my pulmonologist to undergo a bronchoscopy and while i was undergoing a bronchoscopy it went well and uh, just immediately after bronchoscopy when i came out of the theater i started coughing and coughing was more of a convul it was a convulsive episodes of coughing almost what you see in convulsions i was going through the same and within 2 hours i was on ventilator because the cough did not stop it's not moving pardon excuse me it's not moving now when it comes to treat your colleague keep your cool while the world around you is bursting up my family was very curious was very anxious and was very disturbed through what i was going on and the doctors who were around me or my colleagues were really afraid or scared that their boss is on the table and is going through lot of problems so the decision making was not able to happen and therefore when you are treating your colleagues you treat like your family members whatever as a patient don't just think that he is another of your colleague but always think that he is your patient now i was diagnosed by dr atul mehta from us uh, when he came to bombay i just went to show him and i was diagnosed with a hypersensitivity airway disorder or excessive dynamic airway collapse but before that 
many labeled me to be a psycho, having a psychosomatic disorder and why one should labor, be labeled as a psychosomatic patient i just don't know what but what i know is that people should actually try to find out the cause of a disease rather than labeling a patient to be psychosomatic this was the diagnosis which was made and which was made just by physician and radiologist collaboration if physician and radiologist do collaborate with each other do talk with each other they can reach to some conclusions it was a rare disease and the treatment was only surgical for first time i went to boston in 2016 i was airlifted in a commercial flight air india at that time i was on niv ventilator when i was airlifted i was being managed by niv ventilator and i was advised surgery by the surgeons over there and the physicians over there that this disease has only a surgical correction which is possible and basically i was scared looking at my age looking at my job being a surgeon still i was scared to undergo a surgery which was a major one and hardly that surgeon has operated 106 cases by that time it's such a rare disease and he's the only one surgeon who is operating this disease in entire of the globe now the surgical procedure was a complicated one so i was actually very much concerned along with my family and i opted for a conservative management and i came back but there was definitely a need because i was going on to ventilator n number of times i have my family has counted me and my daughter told me just before i came that you have gone to ventilator 27 times and still i am operating working so i had been taken to boston back in 2017 in this condition i was on a stretcher on a ventilator deeply and sedated and breathing on a ventilator this is where i arrived to boston before surgery and my surgeons told me that it is a major surgery which we are doing and they fixed my trachea to the vertebral column with a polypropylene mesh now my trachea is totally fixed from in the entire thoracic portion with a polypropylene mesh so that it does not collapses when i get cough otherwise whenever i was coughing the posterior wall was collapsing and was touching the anterior wall and that was causing excessive cough so that posterior wall is now fixed to the vertebral column and therefore i have now doing well after the my surgery but the life did not end there and i got another setback in 2018 when i got a myocardial infarction i was just resting in my ot operation theater in the doctor's lounge i got pain in the chest as well as in both of my arms i was told immediately taken to the cath lab and definitely that's because i got this infarction in the operation theater and i was taken immediately to the angio cath lab myocardial damage could not happen and the angioplasty was done successfully now what i am doing now i am walking i am doing weight trainings i am doing yogas i have changed my lifestyle now still i work from 8 am to 7 pm or 8 pm every day but i get up at 4:30 and do all these things before i leave to the hospital i have changed my diet i have reduced lot of weight and i have gone to a very healthy diet so and still i have not stopped learning i continuously learn i have now become uh, trying to become a robotic surgeon also so in learning you will teach and in teaching you will learn that is what we think and uh, dnb general surgery fn minimal access and laparoscopic workshops are being done at my place for young surgeons so hope don't lose hope even if it's a bad time because after every sunset there is a sunrise from everyone there is a scar 
and every scar tells a story a story that says i survived thank you thank you thanks a lot